Um, well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to GDG UK and Ireland AI ML track. Uh, today, um, uh, myself and uh, David Walsh uh, are happy to welcome Beryl Sermacek, um, who will be talking to us about uh, talking to us about trust, building trustworthy um, AI with uh, Google. So uh, we're both very excited to have you here today. Um, but first, if um, if you don't mind, I'll do a small introduction, and I hope you'll uh, fill in uh, uh, fill in the gaps because uh, you're a very interesting, uh, very interesting person, and one of the people I'm happy exists exists on this planet because you do that thing uh, that thing of trying to improve the world, which is just wonderful to see, and I think. We need uh, we need more of that. Um, so you are a computer um, a co computer vision and AI scientist, um, and Beryl actually has her um, has a YouTube channel where she um, put, puts up uh, videos about um, climate uh, climate change and AI, um, and also on the on the point of spreading. Uh, or multiplying this uh, this existence of uh, good people that try to fix the problems that the rest of us sort of cause. Um, uh, Beryl is uh, has a is the organizer of the School of AI uh, for Netherlands, and um, in there they uh, they teach uh, various lectures um, on uh, I think re related. To climate change is is that correct or is it other topics? The, yeah, very close. It's climate adaptation of cities. Oh, yeah. very good. My um, I'll have to share that with my mom. She'd be uh, very interested. She's she just finished her degree, graduated today. Sorry, oh, and um, on thank you on uh, applied social science, and she was very interested in like how to make cities more livable and how to improve that. And climate change has to be part of that. Beryl is also, sorry, Beryl is also a, GD, a GDE uh, for, that's Google Developer Expert for um, uh, machine learning. Hence, we found your contact. And yeah, that's that's all I have to say. Thank you for very much for the introduction. <laughs> um, I, I, will, uh, uh, I will put up your slides now. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, um, I actually I did want to ask a little bit more about the about the as, uh, about your the school of AI in Netherlands. When did that start, or how did that come about? Oh, uh, it started I think three years ago, and it started with a small group of people, uh, which we call for gathering every um, Thursday of each month, something something like that. And the idea was to share AI knowledge and also try to start some community in our local area that um, uh, students, companies can come together and discuss how to make uh, algorithms really useful for applications. And uh, both sides could benefit from each other. So that's how we started and um, we continued School of AI for two years until pandemic it was a real life event um, that we brought uh, cookies drinks also and uh, had nice bring fun. back the cookies <laughs> <laughs> and um, due to pandemic everything started online now we put our tickets on eventbrite uh, there are nice things of course now everybody can join all around the world we've got uh, people participating from uh, other side of the planet I'm happy to see that, uh, even though some people are really missing to be in real environment, of course. But um, personally, I'm happy, happy to reach to more people. Mm -hmm. So maybe in the future, we do it hybrid. Oh, that would be lovely. If you don't mind me asking, Beryl, um, I, we spoke earlier about some of the projects that you've done, um, and they seem to be focused on energy con uh, conservation and reducing impact. Um, mm -hmm on uh, more urban and city environments and whatnot. But um, I was just wondering if there was any particular project in my, that comes to your mind is that has like one of the biggest impacts um, that you'd be the biggest advocate for. 
Uh, well, I wouldn't say a biggest advocate, but uh, something that I'm happy with, uh, that we started to work on using low-cost uh, sensors that anybody can buy on the market for a very cheap price. And it also enables people to multiply those sensors to, learn, to cover larger areas, as large as possible. And we try to make uh, privacy preserving, of course, uh, human detection methods to know approximately how many people, how close they are. But um, these applications should be done very carefully, of course, not disturbing privacy of people. And uh, therefore, these low-cost uh, sensors also enable, uh, enable us to get very low resolution data. The challenge is the data is not only very low resolution, but also very noisy. So we need to benefit from AI algorithms to identify if there's people or, or not and how close they are. Initially, this project started for energy uh, consumption of uh, smart buildings within cities because uh, cities are one of the major, uh, sorry, uh, the buildings within the cities are one of the major contributors to CO2 in the atmosphere. And uh, we are using a lot of energy, more than we need. Now, I'm not using any light, for instance, because it's still a little bit bright outside. And um, uh, these kind of sensors could even understand uh, whether I'm relaxed in the environment or not. If I'm feeling like uh, I'm getting a little bit stressed, maybe it has to turn on the light. But if I'm behaving uh, relaxed, it doesn't maybe need to turn on the light yet. So it's not only if it's getting dark, switch it on, but also understanding the comfort of people uh, to know whether we should do something, switch it on, switch the lights on or change the heating, cooling. Uh, that could be also done by understanding a little bit how people are really acting in the environment. Are they really feeling comfortable or not? So we, really uh, we used AI and local sensors, as I said, for doing so. Later on, the application also served to COVID uh, cases that you know, we need to know how close, how, how many people are there in offices, for instance. And um, yeah, previously you mentioned uh, before we started, it's so true. Sometimes you developed an algorithm, a solution, but it might go to multiple applications. Like in this case, we did it for energy preserving and it also served to COVID um, prevention, COVID spread prevention. It's It sounds like a great uh, like tool, um, especially in the reactive nature that it, uh, it can be implemented um, uh, based on the environment uh, that you're occupying. Um, so thank you very much it's for answering the Thanks question. Thanks for your question. Yeah. Well, will we get started? Are you ready? Oh. Yes, uh, are you sharing my slide? Thank uh, you yep. very much for this very nice introduction. There's nothing that I can add more. I'm so much honored to be here. And thank you very much to anybody who is watching this online. Thanks for your time. I'm Beril and I'm located in the Netherlands, in the east side of the Netherlands. I've been working on computer vision and AI. And as I'm introduced, I'm also a Google developer expert because I like Google tools a lot. Um, uh, it's not for marketing Google, but uh, these tools are quite user friendly. And today I will mention how they can be used for developing trustworthy, but also responsible AI. Maybe some of you have watched several lectures of mine on my YouTube channel. I don't know if you see me for the first time. I'm sure you haven't, but maybe some of you have seen. Previously, I talked a lot about how to develop trustworthy AI, and I used uh, Google uh, tools as well. But today I also want to touch a little bit to responsible development of AI, a little bit step forward. And I will mention the difference between having trust to an AI and also having responsible AI. If I can go through my slides, let's see. Yes. 
This is my talk agenda. I hope I don't make you too tired. And I can see your YouTube comments, I think, on the uh, chat link here. So if you've got questions, you can always write there on the comments uh, on YouTube. So I can try to answer. First of all, I will start with our need to trust why we cover this topic. Then I will uh, shortly introduce uh, something which I discussed several times, maybe some of you seen, developing trustworthy AI. And uh, I will add something new, um, developing responsible AI and how we can do that using Google tools. And I will mention some several other tools also, which are developed by other Google developer experts, quite interesting ones. And let's go further. First of all, our need to trust. I'm trying to see my, yeah. So um, we humans are social creatures. And we don't have only physical needs, but we've got also social needs. And psychologically, these social needs are expressed with Maslow's hierarchy pyramid that you see in this triangle. And this shows what needs we have most and what need comes after what. For instance, self-actualization, the top one that we want to achieve, cannot come before we satisfy the other needs. Our first need, the one at the basic, at the bottom, is to provide ourselves food, water, shelter. And then the second need is security, safety, trust. And then having good environment uh, relationships, then having self-esteem to ourselves. And then we can go towards, hopefully, to, uh, self-actualization in our lives, like finding our passion, doing what we came here for, finding our creativity, our own unique skills, and so on. But this self-actualization cannot be done before we get those basic needs. For humans, you see now, how important it is to have trust on something because it's one of our basic needs. As you see in the bottom, like food and water, we need trust. Assume a baby, if, if a baby uh, is uh, given uh, no food and water, but baby doesn't have any caregiver, uh, he or she doesn't have any trustworthy environment, baby will die. This is how important the trust is. And trust is also important when we grow up. It doesn't change anything. When we grow up, still we need to develop trust. And now we are doing business. Either we buy something, uh, I order something online, I subscribe to a website, I get a bank account, apply to a bank, apply to a job and somebody else develops something or you're the developer you make a framework and you sell it to a customer you can be both sides and the trust is important for both two sides because both of them are people people have need have needs this trust need is valid for developer developer needs to trust on the algorithm that he developed and also the one who pays who uses it needs to trust on what he or she pays and you can see this already in our real life like you apply to a bank and your application these days goes through some ai algorithms then you get a result either your mortgage application credit card application is accepted or not the decision comes and you got all the reasons to also ask why this decision is given we will come to this why area now the AI gives a decision, like doctor gives a decision your, about your health. It's, he might be using some AI algorithms, like putting your blood test to a machine to give the result. Uh, or you made a job application and you your resume these days goes to AI algorithms. Then you got a um, question, why this decision is given? So that brings us to explainability part in order to trust on things we need to start explaining 
like for instance you ask your, your doctor why this decision is given the doctor said you need the surgery and you ask why explain it to me then i can believe and i can trust in what you're saying if you explain it to me i will uh give an example of a person who also brought up this trust issue of online models online systems it's called uh, somebody called Latanya Sweeney. Maybe you heard Latanya's sto story. Latanya was told that her friends, when or colleagues, when they search her name, surname online, uh, they always found out some advertisements at the right site. Uh, something like saying that is Latanya arrested? Is Latanya uh, found in uh, in? in police station, something like that. And uh, the colleagues and friends were very worried what's going on. Is Latanya really involved in something? Actually, Latanya has never been involved in anything in such critical, but uh, Latanya was also a, a professor at a, a good university, uh, I think in Harvard, I'm not pretty sure at the moment. Uh, she was a data scientist, so she started digging out why this is happening, why always my name is entered and these is Latanya arrested advertisements come up. Uh, she's never been arrested in her life. And she does some analysis that she finds out that uh, these advertisements are quite biased to names. And her name uh, is from a black community name. And uh, somehow the algorithms learned that uh, if, if it's uh, from this community, uh, maybe people are searching whether he or she is arrested or not, like things. And uh, algorithms trained biased when they are putting advertisements. This is not ethical, this is not acceptable, this is not a trustworthy AI system that we want to see online operating. So uh, this also brought up why, uh, yes, it's Harvard, it's validated. Um, uh, this also brought up why we should really look at how much we can trust on our algorithms. And we have to accept that we will never have unbiased AI. AI is always trained by looking at some examples and uh, we will always have some bias but what we want is uh, the user can see how the decision is made so he or she can uh, know what's going on whether i can trust on it or not for instance if her friends and colleagues were also explained how this uh, tool came up with this uh, results at the advertisements, if they understood how this decision is made, they would also immediately decide I'm not looking at these advertisements because they are not related. But if they don't know how this black box is working, then they worry what's going on. This is not getting acceptance in our society in this way. And of course, we've got uh, more applications in our real life which are very critical and let's assume that you've seen probably some papers. Uh, a little bit noise is added to image. Left side is the normal image. And after adding very tiny little bit of noise, the right side image is obtained. As with human eye, I cannot say the difference between left and right. Both of them are pink, pink, pink to me. But uh, for AI, it sees, it recognizes different features when it analyzes. And then AI decides left side is pig and right side is airliner. Probably the uh, <laughs> ears are like uh, flight uh, airplane uh, wings. And I assume that you are using such a system in a self-driving car and you didn't recognize the cyclist, then you will uh, run over a big trouble. So we don't want to have such untrustworthy systems and we want to know how the decision is taken before we can trust on it. This applies even when the performance is very good. Why? Let's see this example, maybe you've seen. In the beginning of these uh, explainability studies, 
uh, people also seen some good examples, but they were extremely good. Uh, an AI model was trained to identify whether an animal is husky or wolf. They are quite similar. They both look like each other. And the AI algorithm was able to identify whether it's husky or wolf with 98 point something percent performance. That's really too good to be true. Sometimes when the results are too good, you also ask why this, this is so good. You have to ask that. So you want to know how come it can be really so good performance. Maybe there's something tricky going on. We will look at it later. So let's continue. Uh, that's why with good examples and bad examples I showed, uh, some good reasons and bad reasons, we start to look at how these decisions are taken. This field is called nowadays XAI or explainable AI, but you might also hear it like interpretable AI, which used to be a popular name in the past, the blue ones. And we don't hear a lot interpretable AI some reason anymore, but we hear more explainable AI in order to develop trust into these AI algorithms. We used, doesn't matter what you say, XAI, interpretable AI, explainable AI, we use these algorithms to try to develop some trust. So how do we do that? You know how it works. We've got AI or ML model that we made. We want to train it. And in order to train it, we show some training examples and then some input test data comes after we train the model and we deploy it somewhere the decision is taken. The next step for XAI is to ask the question, why this decision is taken? And the explainable AI algorithms explains this to us, depending on the audience. If you explain the decision, uh, I always take my mother as an example. She's a good example to me because she's a very intelligent woman, but she doesn't know anything technical. Um, so if I explain my mother why this decision is taken by, telling about these features are extracted in this layer, therefore this decision is taken. Because I put too many layers to my AI model, something like that. She would say, what, what, what are you talking about? But if I explain her differently, like because my training data had some bias, I put too many a uh, woman and two less men, then it didn't learn the difference of this. As if I explain it differently to my mother, uh, she would understand it. So uh, it, it's important whom you are talking to. Are you talking to someone non-technical who is using the algorithm? Are you talking to someone who is writing code? You, you need to speak to that person differently. And are you talking to someone who will buy your AI model? Uh, you have to describe your uh, explainable model differently. That's why in the literature, when you look explainable AI algorithms, you will see so many of them. That's why, uh, that's because we need different ones uh, to explain this decision-making system to different people for different use cases. And uh, as I said, depending on the given audience, the decision is explained. You choosing the right XAI method, choosing the right explainable AI method, then it's after it's explained why this decision is given, it's uh, still up to person whether they want to decide or not. I cannot force them to dis decide. And there is nothing to tell like this is 99% trustworthy. This is something personal. Um, we can say 99% performance for an algorithm given the data set, training set, test set, but uh, we cannot say how much trustworthy it is. This is totally up to individual. But our responsibility to clearly explain things. And this explainable AI methods do it in different ways given audience, as I said. Either they might refer to training data because I had these, these, these in my training set, 
these uh, maybe training examples were unbalanced. I have to change them differently. They have to explain referring to training model. They might explain things referring to input model because I, I, I've given this decision that you might have tumor in this area, like I'm talking about the medical data, because I've seen these edges here, like what I was putting my attention on. I might refer to input data when I'm explaining why this decision is taken. And I might refer to model itself because I put too many layers, because I trained it too long or cut it too short. Uh, I might also refer to the model itself. Uh, of course, the developer would understand that better. Depending on the audience, I might choose the explainable AI method, which refers to either training data model or the input. Uh, which one is the relevant to the explainability problem in that case. And then the trust is up to people. And we assume that if we do this interpretability, explainability, XAI methods, then we don't have black box anymore. We provide maybe not full transparency, but we make the black box a little bit transparent, understandable, hopefully. As I said, the methods are chosen depending on the user, but also depending on how much focus you want, how much transparency you want. Is it okay only if I tell it's, it made this decision because it, I was focusing on this in the input, or should I say exactly what kind of feature what I was focusing? Maybe I have to put you, uh, give you more information of detail. And depending on the problem of focus, depending on the mathematical methods available to me or the users can uh, understand easily. And depending on whether I need to explain during the training process or after deployment process, I can choose an XAI method depending on these criteria. And of course, um, I can explain the entire model. I can explain only some components of the model because my output was like this, like output layer was like this, or I can really go into layer by layer explaining. So that's also dependent on the use case. And these are some popular XAI methods. As I said, there are so many of them. Uh, but you will see around if you look, there are decision trees based explanation like decision rules, feature importance is where I will show some examples, uh, Salin's mask and so on. These are the very popular ones and people still invent new explainable AI algorithms. It's going to be a never ending or it will continue some more decades probably, this explaining algorithms developments. For instance, one common one is shop or shape. How do you want to pronounce shape additive explanations model? Uh, I frequently use in my courses this Titanic data set. Uh, it's very sad, but it's also real. And it's also uh, making really relevance of understanding how these explainability algorithms are working. For instance, for this shop uh, feature importance uh, listing case. Uh, let's assume that you, we are looking at five only passengers. Uh, assume that we are looking at one passenger in the first line. Uh, she was uh, she survived. Her name was this Miss Elizabeth, uh, female. Uh, her age was 19, 29, and her ticket number, her cabin, and boat, and where she was going, home location, and so on. So the, these are the passenger lists of Titanic. This is a real data set. What we did here, we picked up this survived or not column. We took it out and we used it as a class, as a label. And the rest were features. Some features were eliminated since they make no sense. For instance, ticket number is not making any relevance to whether it survived or not. But what we left is class and um, gender, age, and the cabin number, uh, and yeah, a few more features that you see at the right. 
And the training is done, as I said, uh, by looking at the labels, whether they survived or not. Then after training is done, this shape importance listing is helping to list which of these features make the biggest impact to train this model right in the right way. Then we've got the list this shape algorithm gives us at the right side. We see that is female, whether female or not, was the most important feature to identify whether this person survived or not. Class number was the second, cabin number was the third, uh, and age comes a little later and so on. So uh, we also understand on the horizontal line, okay, is female very important, very impactful, but is it making positive impact or negative impact? We also see, okay, this feature influences a lot, but is it influenced in a positive way or negative way? What we see here is very high, um, is female, being female, uh, was very important, also import, uh, influence in very positive way. So what does it mean is if you're female, you've got very high chances to survive in Titanic. And for instance, age, you see the inverse ratio in the horizontal because getting older, people had less chances to survive. By just looking at this, we understand that younger female people survived more and older male people died most in the accident. And the cabin is important probably uh, because uh, maybe they, they had easier access to uh, output. Some cabins had easier access to outside probably. So by just looking at feature, you explain a lot about the story even. You explain a lot about data, you explain about story, you explain about the model, how it trained. The model made more learning from whether female or not, for instance. We explain about model, we explain about result. By just looking at this XAI algorithm, we explain a lot. And we cannot call it black box anymore, right? That's uh, got a lot of transparency already. That's how the explainable AI algorithms are helping us as an example. That was a um, table data that we classified. And if we do it to images, looking at the pixel-based importance, we can also determine which pixels are making the highest impact in making right classification. For instance, if I uh, put the blanket out, this uh, algorithm could still say that it's a dog. If I remove the background, algorithm still says that it's a dog. But if I remove the face, the algorithm couldn't say that it's a dog. Uh, therefore, this region was the most important one in given decision. Now, go back to our good example, which had 98 person example. When the explainable AI algorithms used, they figured out that the algorithm was given the decision by looking at the background. And it was given the decision that it's a husky or a wolf by just looking at the background, whether there's snow or not. And it said it's a wolf if there's snow. It said it's a husky because it's more do domestic animal. Uh, but if there's no snow, it said it's husky. That's why it had very good performance and it was looking nothing at all about the animal itself when it's making the decision. So it's 98% performance, very good. Can you sell it? No, and you shouldn't because it's not a trustworthy algorithm. So that's why we really, really need the trustworthy algorithm for both sides. So as a developer, as a business owner, as someone who puts the algorithm on deployment, and also the one who uses the algorithm, we both need the trust to our algorithm and explainable AI algorithms are helping us a lot with that. And um, if I go further, I want to, as I say, touch to something more. Uh, now let's assume that we've got these explainable AI algorithms, but in order to put something into real deployment and to create, let's say, a business using 
uh, AI. Uh, we need something more. It's not only enough to explain the models. We've got also need for transparency. We need to know exactly how the bias is. We need to make sure that these algorithms are ethical. These algorithms are factual uh, and also good reported. The data sets are good reported. The models are good reported, not only for developers, but also in a way that uh, uh, my mother can understand when she reads. And also these uh, models, when they're deployed, they should be constantly improved uh, by getting feedback from both authorities, you, uh, cust customer you gave the algorithm who's got the business and also their customers who are the users of the AI algorithm. And this brings us to responsible AI topic. Responsible AI covers how our relationship between uh, authorities, how our relationship between people who are using it. And are we ethical? Are we really making things um, transparently to them? And do they really understand? And are they happy with it? And are we constantly improving ourselves with respect to their desires, their feelings about how they feel about the algorithm? Few slides up to here are going to be from a uh, talk that I've given at the right corner. It's from other Google developers and I found them quite nice. I want to address Google's AI principles towards responsible AI, uh, which I found a good way to go through step by step. So these are the principle. Be socially beneficial. So explaining is not enough at all. We talked about trustworthy AI development uh, using explainable AI tools, but now we go one step further to responsible AI. And step one, are we socially beneficial? Are we doing good to our society? Second, avoiding creating or reinforcing unfair bias. And if there is bias, of course there are bias in the algorithm. Are we explaining it in a good way how it could be having bias so people know exactly transparently? Three, be built and tested for safety. Four, be accountable to people. And uh, five, incorporate privacy design principles. They're all listed on Google sites. Just search on Google search engine to reach there. Uh, how to apply the privacy design principles. And uh, six, uphold high standards of scientific excellence. Of course, we know how to do it, right? Good developers over there. And seven, be made available for users that accord with these principles. Always be in communication with people to make sure that you are serving for their good, for their benefits. And how do we do that with using Google tools? Google offers us some steps to go there. Maybe you're familiar with uh, these steps. Defining problem, constructing, preparing data, build and train model, evaluate and deploy monitorial model. At each step, we also need to ask questions uh, to make sure that these steps are done responsibly. Like if we are defining the problem, we also need to ask questions like who is my machine learning AI system is used for and uh, is the good fit to solve this problem? And uh, preparing the data, we need to address uh, biases in the data and also is the data ethical or not, for instance. And training the model, we need to ask questions about whether we are training it fairly uh, in privacy in pre preventing ways. And evaluating data, what kind of evaluation metrics are needed. Uh, what kind of transparency should I put into this evaluation? And after deployment, uh, well, yeah, uh, we, we also need to keep monitoring our model and we need to well document it for different stakeholders. And responsible AI offers us that we need to do this uh, in con constant cycles 
like defining the problem each time we need to check with the users with authorities whether we are addressing the problem right uh, when we prepare the data constantly we need to check again with people we are using this data but is it really good is there real bias or not do i need to add new data or not building the data i need to ask uh, whether do I need to rebuild it, are they deteriorating or not, evaluation metrics are good or not, or whether I need to redeploy, monitor differently or not. This should be on constant going cycle. And uh, I suggest you to also look at people. Um, it's also, uh, yeah, it's super interesting for people from Europe, but if you are in, watching this outside of Europe, I still recommend you to look at the document of the responsible AI principles of EU documentation, which offers us to do these steps with users in circles all the time. And the nice thing with working with Google is these cycles could be done with easy tools very easily. Each step has some tools to apply for. You can go to just responsible AI link and you can go to some tutorials uh, and you will find some collab books. But besides all, for each step that we mentioned, for instance, for defining problem, we've got tools to use. And using these tools, we can extract, for instance, some visual, visuals that we can communicate with users quickly without suffering with it. Uh, Google Tools helps us to do the steps so quickly and also uh, in, in a professional way and in a way that we can repeat each time easily. Uh, like for construction, constructing data, we've got easy to use tools to document our data sets. I need to speed up a little bit, I'm guessing, uh, because of the time. Um, we need, we've got tools to document our data set properly that users, even non-technical users can understand. And for instance, there is a tool called Know Your Data. It offers us uh, what the training data is. It's very well visualized. It says you've got this class, uh, very good resolution, but this class doesn't have good resolution images and it has less images. You've got such statistics about your data set, very well documented, that you know exactly how to improve your training data set. These are all Google tools for each step you can go to a specific Google tool to um, get something out of the tool that you can communicate with the stakeholders and the end users. So these steps could be done in circles easily, iterated easily, improved easily. For instance, TensorFlow has a very nice thing called federated learning, which offers us that device-based learning People's data is uh, kept on the device. Everything is learned on the device. And the user doesn't send any data to model, to improve the model, but only some key features, for instance, the model learned are just encrypted and sent to model. And there is nothing about the user at all. And these things could be done by simply getting the appropriate Google uh, tool that you can use within the process uh, to improve your communication with the user. And I will mention, I, I just ask you to go step by step. I will ask the organizers how much time I have and whether I have questions or not to go through the details. How are we with time? Can I go to details? 17 minutes left. Okay. So, uh, for, for instance, uh, for evaluating our models, we've got a very nice tool called What If Tool. And I've given a recommended lecture over there. It's uh, on my YouTube channel that I explained how to use What If Tool. And What If Tool, for instance, after training the model, offers you a visualization and that you can use this visualization for communicating with your stakeholder, with users as well. And uh, for instance, here you see the data points and different classes after the training is done. You click on the data point and you see which data point is assigned to where. And sometimes you see data points 
very close to each other and you believe that they should have been in the same class but you see that they are in different colors they're in different classes uh, and you you think that maybe the model um, didn't learn that they are belonging to the same class maybe i need to improve my training model uh, that my model can learn that these two data points are belonging to the same class uh, it, it makes a better decision by using this uh, post hoc method after training the model you can still dig further information to see whether you need some improvements to retrain it or not or why the decision is given in a certain way you can also use these tools these visualizations very easily to communicate with your users with your stakeholders there are fairness indicator tools offered and finally which is also very handy the uh, model cart toolkit and um, model card toolkit allows you to uh, write uh, explain your model to stakeholders in very professional way and that even non-technical people can understand but also they understand all the details that they really need to know for transparency so these all steps that i mentioned should be done by communicating with people and they need to be improved all the time uh, it should be a constant improvement process and this is why uh, we call it something one step further than explainable ai it's not only explaining the model itself but also it's finding good ethical ways ethical attitude to communicate with people and to make sure that they are serving well they are improved well and this is the responsible ai part and i'm so happy that google provides tools to do each step of this responsible ai development to make things easier as i said there are some few other helpful tools besides google tools uh, of course, it's related to Google. This Keras is uh, working with TensorFlow, uh, and um, there are some uh, GDs also who contribute to, to these toolboxes. For instance, there's something called GradCam. I've got hands-on lecture if you go to my YouTube channel about how to use GradCam. It's uh, telling you exactly where the algorithm is focusing when it's making a decision. For instance, this model predicted a border collie over there, but uh, it was looking at this highlighted area when it's making the decision. Can I trust or not? Yes, I find it trustworthy, but um, I would say I, I have to see more examples personally. That's my personal opinion to trust. But somebody else could say something differently, of course, as I said, after explaining, after communicating the opening the toolbox still it's a personal decision whether we can trust or not another gd google developer expert offers this uh, web page and here you can see exactly the features for each layer of a deep learning i don't know if anybody needs to see that but if you're a developer it's also interesting to look at each layer which features they are learning and it's also maybe you can use it for communicating with people if you explain what they say for instance if you are looking for a cat you have to uh, look whether you see some features of ears nose and in some layers you need to see some features of fur some hairs uh, if, if you see some features that you cannot really identify whether this is coming from a cat or not maybe you got a little doubt about you you should have a little bit doubt about your model what is it looking at in these layers so this could be also used for communicating with people and this is also an interesting tool that you know the gd has developed to see exactly what's going on when you add more layers to a autoencoder model or not how the model is improving or not it's sometimes interesting to use also tasks or board uh, to see such things what happens if i use more layers what happens if i use less layers or less neurons to exactly trust on that you you made the right decision that was also one ethical topic 
whether you made the right decision for your model or not, you can also get a little bit more confidence by seeing that you made the right decision about choosing your model. So that's it for now from me. My website has mentioned my name, surname.com. There you will see my newsletter monthly published, No Junk. And uh, my YouTube channel, School of AI, is there. And you can follow me on Twitter if you like. But I'm mostly talking about climate issues uh, on my uh, posts. So if you're not interested to hear, uh, it's not only about AI. Uh, if you've got questions, I'm very happy to see. Yeah. Thanks very much for that, Viril. Um, that was a, a enlightening talk. There's a question there for you what are the technical different technical skill sets that you think are needed for ai do, do you mean for developing an ai model uh these days it's super easy and google made it super super easier you will just find a collab notebook uh, Colab is an online platform you know you can also save it into your google drive you can put images on your Google Drive, your own image data set if you like, and you can just train algorithms, even if you don't have a good computer at your home. Uh, Colab uses the servers of Google. You can choose even TPU, not only GPU. And these days, these Colab notebooks are just online. Uh, start with finding one, cat and dog classification, Colab, like on, uh, right on Google, you will find one. And then all you need to do is to press on run first. You see how it does all this classification uh, of learning. Then you start going lay, uh, line by line. Where did it read the uh, input image? Where did it make the layers of network? And why these training parameters? Where do they come from? You can start reading about it. Um, you, you, you will start diving into it and you might change some learning parameters. Maybe you end up with different performance. You might start playing with it. Then you will get some confidence. Oh, I can look at different algorithm, different model. And uh, it's always good to fail a lot because when you fail, then you Google it and you end up with finding more. For developing responsible AI, what skills you need? You need so many different multiple skills, I think. Maybe you even need a team team of different disciplines, uh, I would say. Uh, I appreciate multidisciplinary work, therefore. As uh, Jana mentioned, uh, her mother was uh, from social uh, area. And uh, it, it's clearly seen in the beginning how she could contribute to these uh, models to make a real social interaction in responsible AI. For instance, she knows so much better than me about how to communicate to an end user, how to make a public survey, whether they are happy with the model, whether they find it ethical or not. Uh, she knows such uh, communication methods for responsible AI much better than I do because I didn't study that. So it's a um, multidisciplinary work would work better it's if you're funny. making a responsible AI development. That's um, that uh, uh, that's a great point um, that you do need the um, eyes of people from all different angles for this mm -hmm. for this kind of work. You can't just do it in isolation. Um, there's another question there for you um, again. Uh, what what do you think the future of AI would look like? Oh. Uh, you know, we, are, we are not going to be uh, replaced or killed, I think. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, um, feature What's your data AI, to prove this now? <laughs> feature of AI, AI will be in, of course, more in our lives uh, to automate the redundant things which we want to uh, replace. Uh, for instance, uh, in hospitals still, uh, doctors are creating data sets uh, by putting labels around the tumor by hand. This doctor is working eight hours to use a paint program after studying all the medical schools. 
He is mm -hmm. using the paint program to label a data set. This is uh, qu quite unnecessary. He should be communicating with patients, curing patients, going to conferences, writing papers, reading papers, writing books, sharing his knowledge. He used to be doing something else. It's not that AI replaces the doctor, but AI replaces the redundant stuff that he shouldn't be doing as a doctor. It's so awesome. what AI can do, AI can label the tumor and again, the AI will not be perfect, but you might make a very easy tool that the doctor can just look and say, oh, this is correct label or not. And he doesn't spend eight hours on paint, but he spends eight minutes a day to just check the results. But that's a, the, the same thing in so many industries. And uh, mm -hmm. I find it so little... a very good point. And like minimizing waste in any sector is always a good thing. Mm -hmm. Um, like you say, with uh, like doctors wasting their time. Well, not necessarily wasting their time, but reducing wasted time that they could be spent on better, uh, either developing their skills or addressing doctors' issues. It, it, it translates in any sector. We have so many, so many issues all over the world that we still need all the like manpower and brain power to solve them. And it really, it, it's true. It's disheartening when people are gonna. Somebody asked, please, yeah. can you repeat the name of the tool you mentioned when answering the first question? Spell it. Is it correct? Uh, which tool did I mention? Uh, that um, was the one you could download and install on your drive, I think you were mentioning earlier. Oh, Colab. 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 Oh. And uh, how can we, can I, can I write there? Um, no. I, you I, can I, write it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. it's, uh, Google Colab, we have it up there. Then. C O L A B. Yeah. There we have it. There. <laughs> Sorry, I made you a little. Uh, <laughs> there. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I. Um, it's. Um, I, the. Res sorry, respon responsible AI and trust for the AI. The, it's, we really do need to or developers really do need to include all of this because I, I feel like a lot of great uses would be wasted um, because they just won't be accepted by people simply for not understanding for not understanding what's going on there um, and that's that's such, such a waste and it's it's true that people do need to think about this from like as you're developing it from the start to, to make sure that it is actually doing what you want it to be doing and that it's it's doing it correctly us. Yeah, first of all, uh, I'm glad that in EU we've got uh, such rules uh, of ethics and responsible AI rules. Uh, you cannot just put cameras and uh, get people's or private information and uh, do something unethical to people with AI. Uh, I mean, these applications are not accepted. I'm grateful that there are uh, monitoring on this and this could not be application but also sometimes there are some small issues uh, even though the developer intended good but they missed some points in the data set in terms of ethics and um, use case uh, they can still refer to a book that i mentioned the trustworthy ai reference book of eu commission to uh, find out uh to check really whether their application is acceptable or not and i suggest this to people from out of eu as well it's a good documentation and um, the second part is um we human beings as in the man beginning i mentioned um are social creatures who cannot live without trust it's our basic need it's like food and water we need to trust so if uh, it turns out that all the models which are serving around us becomes like robotic, untrustworthy, assume that you are living in a planet like that. That's not going to be somewhere we want to be in. So yeah, we, it'll breed resentment in the system it, that's supposed to nurture and support us. Um, so yeah, um, I do have a question though myself in how do you find would be the, oh, I suppose how to ask this, what would you consider one of the biggest hurdles uh, towards the development of AI in a respectable and 
um, healthy way. Probably the one of the biggest challenges is data, <laughs> because uh, you have to preserve people's rights, privacy, and uh, you have to think about whether you are using too much energy, bandwidth, and so on. And um, you need to check there's already a lot of data, whether they are useful or not, how to organize it. And uh, like in the beginning, you uh, asked me about the application we made for buildings. In buildings, we cannot put cameras. It's not allowed that we can watch really people. Mm. It's why we used a very low resolution sensor. And it's a super low resolution, like 16 pixels, <laughs> not even 20 pixels. It's impossible to identify the person. You just see probably there is a person. It's quite a holistic way of making a decision. And um, that, then all the challenges come. If you cannot put a camera, how do you count people? Hmm. And so like, do you uh, use motion heat tracking and things like that in order to facilitate monitoring of movement from place to place? Or is yeah, actual... every sensor comes with a uh, 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 opportunities and disadvantages. You need to find out which sensor works for your application good, but also works in ethical way, responsible way, trustworthy way. That's the data part is, I think, the challenging one. E even to start, you want to start and you, you need the data. <laughs> I, I, didn't, um, I didn't even think of the point you raised with energy consumption I was going to be like oh the data sets are always too small but then what if there's too much or you're processing too much unnecessarily was that that's an issue too now sometimes even uh, observing energy usage of people is unethical so we we also need to check whether we've got rights to know how much energy uh, building is consuming or not uh, probably we can do the application, but we need to make sure that uh, if we went through the legal procedures to inform people ethically, responsibly, like I'm going to do this application for this purpose, therefore I need this data, are you allowing me or not? Uh, this is why these Google's uh, uh, listing tools are super important. You list your uh, model, you give it to user. I got a model doing this. I've got data sets trained like this. These Google tools are super important to show exactly transparently what you're doing. Then they can approve it easier. That's great. Um, th uh, thank you very much. Um, I will give people a second if they have any other questions. But we're um, honest. Uh, Dave has any questions? But I think we're we're at time. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, my only final question would be, um, is there anything in particular in the future that you're looking forward to or that you'd like people to be aware of in the future um, that you're wor either working on or maybe colleagues that you work with in the same field um, that you'd like to promote? Yeah, I want to see people more engaged with AI, even non-technical people, to understand AI models better and to contribute to them. Maybe they will find out even ways to make them better. I believe that everybody looks in a different point of view. And sometimes we just look at mathematical models, features, uh, feature importance list and, and things. Somebody else who has no technical background might come up with a strange idea, which can change everything. So I want people to join more, give more ideas. But before giving ideas, they need to understand what we are doing. So these transparency steps are very important to start communicating with non-technical people to Excellent. make the AI reachable. There's another question for you. Um, we that... make a model that starts with other models for their fairness. Yes, that's, um, uh, there, there, there's a Google tool that uh, uh, maybe we have mentioned. Uh, we've got Google tool for fairness indicators but again these indicators are giving you some visuals about how fair decision is made according to this tool you can use the results visualizations either with your developers or to talk to communicate with your uh, stakeholders easier 
And uh, when you just type on Google search search engine, uh, Google fairness indicators, then you will come up with the right page. And um, yeah, again, for if you use what if tool that I mentioned, you will also understand whether the classification is done fairly or not. Such visualizations will help to make things more transparent that you can discuss with other people easier. Oh, good stuff. But again, the trust uh, is a personal issue. I mean, Google cannot say this model is 99% trustworthy. It can only make things easier for us to discuss with other people. It's a personal decision. Still, you can show me everything, every visual, but I can say I still don't trust on you, so you cannot do anything. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose uh, kind of it is in early stages where we need to be uh, kind of give a forum for people to share ideas and understand where everybody's trying to come from so that there's understanding um, before any major developments can occur, I suppose. Um, yeah. But no, that's been a great talk. Um, thank you very much again for joining us today. Thanks everyone for joining. Have a good evening or wherever you are. Have a good day. And I uh, hope to see you again. Many thanks for inviting me. I enjoyed a lot. I'm looking forward Great to, to joining, joining you on uh, on uh, some of the lectures uh, on online then. Um, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for joining and tuning in and everyone. Yeah. Have a nice thank evening. You. Bye.